Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining. Hopefully you can hear me now. I just muted myself until we had some participants join. Um, I'm sure there'll still be some rolling in here, but I'm gonna get started um, just so we have enough time to cover everything. So thank you for joining tonight. Um, I'm Abby Kelly. I'm a primary care sports medicine um, physician at OSS Health, and I have Julie Stefanski here with me. Um, I'll be um, talking first a little bit about my female athlete program that I started here about a year, a little over a year ago. Um, and then Julie will be talking about some of the nutritional um, dietitian side of things um, after I touch on a uh, condition called female athlete triad. How do I get to my next slide? <laughs> Technical difficulties already. <laughs> Here we go. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so just a little bit about myself. Um, I did grow up here in York and I went to Dallas Town. I graduated in 2004. I then went to Elizabethtown College, um, got my BS in um, 2008. I went to medical school at Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine. Uh, and then I did a family medicine residency at St. Joseph Medical Center in Reading, followed by a sports medicine fellowship at York Wellspan. I joined OSS in 2016 and I've been here ever since. Just a little bit about my practice and sort of the scope of my practice. So I do not operate. Um, I practice, again, primary care sports medicine. And um, I basically see a lot of non-operative orthopedic problems. I do a lot of um, sports sideline coverage. Um, I cover two um, high school football teams in the area, Northeastern and Red Lion. Um, I also am the team physician for Messiah University and I help out Dr. Almer over at York College every once in a while. I do a ton of um, musculoskeletal ultrasound in the office and a lot of ultrasound guided procedures. I see a lot of concussions. Um, I just recently started a sports dermatology clinic for athletes around the area. So kind of um, do a um, little bit of everything here at OSS. So I deserved, decided to start this um, program a little over a year ago, um, which I wish had existed when I was a high school and college athlete. Uh, but the goal of the program is to optimize performance in female athletes. Um, so not only manage some orthopedic injuries, but also try to prevent them assess exercise habits, um, address nutritional needs, as well as psychological needs. So um, I put together a team of subspecialists, which you see there listed on the right-hand side, and I'll just go into each one of those subspecialists a little bit and how they can be helpful for uh, the program. So on the orthopedic surgery side of things, we have a few names listed here, some of which may look familiar to you. Um, Kalista Kostopoulos Morris is a new um, orthopedic uh, sports surgeon, and she will be joining us here in the next couple of months. Um, so she's a nice addition to uh, this program. Um, so where orthopedic surgery is concerned, again, I'm not a surgeon, but I work closely with all of these surgeons. Um, we kind of pass pa patients back and forth to each other. Um, and, you know, I may be able to help you with some coping strategies if you sustain um, in, you know, a season ending injury and um, you're out of sport for a little while, address some psychological needs related to that, um, how we can incorporate you into the team, you know, given that you have an injury. Um, I can also help with things like your post-surgical treatment course, you know, for example, say you rupture an ACL, you get, you know, through the surgery, the formal physical therapy, but you're not quite ready to return to the, to return to the field or the court. Uh, you just don't feel strong enough yet, don't have much confidence in that knee. I can help you get plugged in with uh, somebody like a personal trainer or strength and conditioning coach. Um, sports psychology, um, you know, that will address things like depression, anxiety, eating disorders, performance anxiety, um, and then, you know, more recently disaster psychology. COVID-19 is taking a major mental health toll on some athletes, both, you know, middle, middle school, high school, um, and college level. So um, we have to keep that in mind as well. I'm working pretty closely with a place called Cognitive Health Solutions. Um, they have an office here in New York and Hanover. Anza Prasny uh, is a mental uh, performance coach that works towards Hershey, and she um, is the owner of Great Sports Minds. Uh, she was a Division I athlete herself. She played at uh, Delaware Valley. She played basketball um, 
or I'm sorry, University of Delaware. She played basketball there and she is very invested in helping with things like uh, performance anxiety um, and just overall uh, health of the athlete where the mind is concerned. And Jared Spencer uh, is pretty well known in the sports psychology world. He works out of Bethlehem and he is the author of the book called Mind of the Athlete. Um, it's a pretty helpful book that I recommend to pretty much all of my um, female athletes. It's an easy read. I think it's like 10 bucks on Amazon. Um, I read it in two days on the beach. Uh, and it, it was actually pretty informative, um, even if you're not an athlete, uh, in terms of how the mind works. Um, Next, uh, I will let Julie talk mostly about the nutritional side of things, but um, you know, our goal here is to maximize performance through diet. Uh, there are some different types of eating disorders um, that are psychological disorders, such as anorexia and bulimia, but there's also uh, something called disordered eating where uh, you, know, you have unhealthy eating behaviors, either intentional or unintentional, and sometimes athletes just need some education on uh, how much you know, they should be eating and what they should be eating uh, to account for what they're expending during their uh, sport. Um, so along with Julie, uh, I've referred some patients over to Beth Conway over at Wellspan, who used to be Julie's um, partner when I was a fellow over there. So I worked with both of them. Um, and she um, you know, sees several different uh, types of patients, but she uh, will help out with um, my eating disorder patients. I also have used uh, Penn State Health Medical Group Briarcrest um, for adolescent medicine and eating disorders. So if there is a patient that I feel like is suffering from um, an anorexia or bulimia, um, I will send them out that way. They have a whole group of subspecialists, psychologists, psychiatrists, um, dietitians, and uh, physicians out that way that can help out with that type of thing. Our PM&R department, um, we have Dr. Gilhold, Dr. Schultz here in the York office, um, and Dr. Wahlberg in our Mechanicsburg office, and they um, help with things such as concussion management and any type of spine intervention that's necessary for the athlete. OBGYN, um, huge component of the program. Uh, you know, the subspecialist or specialist in this area can help with things like menstrual abnormalities, um, certainly birth control, hormone replacement therapy for um, female athlete triad or osteoporosis, which I'll touch on later, pregnancy, STD testing, annual exams, which generally start at age 21 in an OBGYN's office for a pap and breast exam. Um, Dr. Helen Deitch works over at Wellspan. She is an adolescent and pediatric gynecologist um, who has been very helpful. And, you know, we share some mutual patients between the two of us. So um, been referring some patients over to her, as well as uh, Dr. John Lawrence over at Wellspan OBGYN Tri-Hill. Um, of course, primary care, family medicine, and pediatrics. Um, there are several of these around the area. Um, we have a few that have, have helped or that have agreed to help us help patients get into them if um, a patient is not already established with a primary care physician. Um, but, you know, the primary care doc will be important for managing any chronic medical problems, routine annual exams, vaccinations, and other health maintenance. Um, athletic trainers, which is what ATC stands for, they uh, are the liaison between the athlete and the physician. So I work with athletic trainers every day. I have, um, you know, high school and college athletic trainers texting me on a daily basis, calling me about athletes. So work pretty closely with um, ATCs for injury diagnosis, rehabilitation, as well as injury prevention. There's a couple programs that our athletic trainers can take the athlete through um, to watch how the athlete moves and address maybe any flexibility deficit or strength deficit that the athlete might have. And then they will develop a program, a strengthening program that they can take you through to work on uh, to reduce the risk of injury. Uh, physical therapy and occupational therapy Again, uh, we use for injury rehab, um, and some of them can also, um, also have the tools to do a functional movement screen and fusion ethics. Um, moving on here, just a couple more um, subspecialists in this program. Strength and conditioning, as I sort of touched on earlier, um, John Turpak over at S3 Performance Training has been helpful in getting some athletes in for uh, both group sessions and individual sessions if necessary. Um, we just met with um, Elite Sports Wellness out in Mechanicsburg, and there is a uh, strength and conditioning coach um, has his certification out that way. 
um, that we're definitely going to be working with here in the future. Um, you know, and strength and conditioning can help optimize uh, performance on the field through strength training, but also, also help to prevent injury. Running medicine, we've got a lot of runners that we treat. Um, Jim Clahane is a physical therapist uh, out in the Mechanicsburg area, just next to Cumberland Valley High School. He has a th access to a 3D gait analysis, um, which has been pretty helpful for my athletes. Dr. Dave Granger is one of our surgical podiatrists here. He is a runner himself and is interested um, in addressing any foot and ankle injuries um, in my runners, so he has been helpful. Sports massage, uh, Jill Van Dusen is my masseuse. She's awesome. So take her name down if you're interested in getting a massage. Uh, but she can be help, helpful for things like soft tissue massage and any muscle spasm um, that might be um, necessary in the athlete. Nursing and secretarial staff, uh, they are huge helps with assisting in scheduling and patient care referrals, studies and labs that I might order. And of course our durable medical equipment department for bracing and splinting. These are some common diagnoses in the female athlete. Um, I'm going to touch a little bit on female athlete triad uh, because I think the components of the triad are maybe sometimes talked about and diagnosed, but um, sometimes it's difficult for us to put them all together and, and determine if a female athlete is suffering from um, this condition. So the definition of um, female athlete triad uh, is an interrelation, interrelation between energy availability, uh, which is basically caloric intake, so what you eat, menstrual function, which is your period, and bone mineral density, which is how dense your bones are. Um, so this is the, the triad here. This is a helpful spectrum for sort of a continuum um, for the triad. In the, the green triangle um, is, you know, great health. So your eumenorrheic, which means that you get your period every month, you know, last five to seven days, you have optimal energy availability, um, you know, you're eating properly to account for what you're expending and you have optimal bone health. So no evidence of bone loss, osteoporosis, osteopenia. In the center is the, the blue, um, which, is um, reduced energy availability with or without disordered eating, subclinical menstrual disorders, and maybe a low bone mineral density. And then in the red is the most severe form of the condition, which is osteoporosis, um, absence of a period, and low energy availability with or without an eating disorder, such as anorexia or uh, bulimia. This is just a, a little bit of a timeline or background in um, female sports, passage of Title IX in 1972, affording equal access to female athletes. And in the 1980s, we started seeing these in increasing occurrences of triad related problems, such as stress fractures, eating disorders, irregular menses, osteopenia, osteoporosis. In 1993, there, um, the ACSM came out with the first formally described uh, triad uh, at their national meeting, our yearly meeting. 1997, the ACSM positional um, stand consisted of uh, disordered eating, amenorrhea, and osteoporosis. Um, since then, there have been some updated definitions. Um, more recently, there has been a suggestion of a tetrad instead of the triad, which includes uh, cardiovascular dys dysfunction related to the um, disorder. Um, this is important to note, all females are at risk for this triad or any of the components and they may fall anywhere along that continuum, so it doesn't have to be in the most severe form. Uh, sports that are more common with the triad are those that have an aesthetic component um, where, you know, the athlete is expected to be thin or lean, um, such as skating, gymnastics, ballet, or any dance. Um, they are also, or the triad is also tied to weight class. Uh, you know, such as wrestling, where you have to do your uh, weigh-ins. Um, and I just want to mention that males can also be affected by, um, you know, energy availability and, um, you know, the uh, weight loss type of sports. So just keep that in mind. Um, you know, the energy availability and lack of hormones can actually lead to um, reductions or the energy availability can lead to reductions in osteogenic sex hormones. So um, just keep that in mind that, you know, 
male athletes are also important, but um, I just so happen to be um, talking about female athletes here. Um, so the triad is thought to be um, a kind of a subgroup in this broader uh, red S syndrome. So red S stands for relative energy deficiency in sport, uh, which can affect um, many different systems in the body. Uh, you'll see where that red triangle in, uh, what up, red, the, where the red triangle is within, within the menstrual function, bone health. Um, but it can, you know, really energy deficiency can cause um, several other uh, things, including, you know, your psychological health, cardiovascular, um, GI, uh, et cetera. Um, I'm not going to go over this in too much detail, but this is basically how to calculate your energy availability. And it's basically your energy intake through calories minus your energy expenditure, um, accounting for fat free mass, which there's um, a couple different ways to uh, calculate that. Um, this is the definition of low energy availability. If you calcul calculate that um, lean body mass to be less than 30 um, kcals per kilogram, that's positive, or you can take a look at the patient's BMI and um, anything less than 17.5 um, in terms of BMI is concerning, or in adolescents on that growth chart, if they fall within that less than 85th percentile of expected body weight. Um, these are some, just um, some examples of some apps that you can use on your phone to log what you're eating on a daily basis. And sometimes I, I recommend this to my patients who have not yet been um, to see Julie. Sometimes it's helpful for her to maybe have a, a log or a diary of what the athlete is eating. And you can do that through, you know, writing it down or through some of these uh, apps on your phone. I'll skip over this um, slide. This is just how to, some ways to measure fat-free mass here. Um, the prevalence of clinical disordered eating has been reported as anywhere between 16 and 47%. So on the higher end of that, that's pretty concerning um, in female athletes compared with the general population, which is about 0.5 to 10%. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of restrictive diets out there that, you know, athletes might try vegan, vegetarian, keto, and um, they're not fully educated on what they, they should be getting through diet. So I'll let Julie talk about that a little bit more. Um, so moving on from disordered eating and energy availability into menstrual dysfunction. So this is a very complicated slide of how your hormones work. Uh, it's a feedback mechanism. So you basically want to make sure that there's nothing else that's causing um, your period to be irregular, such as thyroid dysfunction, of course, pregnancy. Um, so this can be determined through way of some laboratory studies that can be ordered by either me or the OBGYN. Um, so menstrual dysfunction ranges from infrequent cycles to primary or secondary amenorrhea. Primary is basically a late onset of menarche. So when you first get your period, um, special attention to the athletes that do not get their period by the age of 14, and they have a history suggestive of an eating disorder. Secondary is basically when you first, you know, you first get your period at a normal age and then your period stops. So anything greater than six months, you know, in terms of a lack of period is concerning and should be worked up as to why that's happening. That's pretty much all I'll say about menstrual dysfunction. Um, so moving on to the bone mineral density. Um, so basically what happens is um, your hormones control um, your bone mineral density. So if you're not eating enough to regulate your hormones, your hormones can then um, cause you to have bones like an 80 year old postmenopausal woman. So um, you can essentially enter into osteoporosis or osteopenia as a teenager. It's really important to catch this type of thing um, before it's too late to reverse. So 92% of peak bone mineral density is achieved by the age of 18 years and peak bone accrual between 11 and 14 years of age. So, you know, parents, coaches, even athletes, if you're noticing that, you know, your child or you have not had a period in six plus months, that is abnormal. That is not normal. So you should um, seek treatment for that or at least a workup as to why that's happening. 
Um, this is a Z-score table. So basically what we do to assess for your bone mineral density is a bone scan. It's non-invasive, it doesn't hurt. Uh, we do have a DEXA scan in this office that we will do for age 12 and over. Otherwise, we usually send um, athletes if they're 12 and under to Wellspan. Um, but there's basically a scoring system um, as severe as osteoporosis is less than or equal to negative two and low bone mineral density is between negative one and negative 1.9 and lower than expected for age range is less than or equal to negative 1.0. This is important for um, risk factors in terms of participating in um, your sport. So um, this just tells you where we scan the body part that's um, sometimes a little different than an adult um, because of you know, how the bone develops in an adolescent. Um, so that's no need to go into that uh, specifically, but indications for a DEXA scan, which is the bone mineral density scan. If uh, the athlete meets at least one or more of these criteria here listed, um, they should have a DEXA scan performed. Eating disorder, BMI less than 17.5, menarche, which is on sort of period greater or equal to 16 years of age um, and so forth. So, you know, stress fractures are really important. Um, your period is really important and your eating habits are really important to assess whether or not you need to move forward with DEXA scanning. Um, if um, they have at least two or more of these criteria, they fit into the moderate risk and they should have the DEXA scanning performed. Um, this is just some more information on what types of traumatic fractures or stress fractures um, would fit into that risk stratification. So how do we restore bone mineral density? The best way to restore loss of uh, bone density is by increasing your energy availability and optimizing weight gain and resumption of menses. Um, Calcium does not increase bone mineral density, but it might aid in preventing further decreases. Um, so, you know, nutritional and hormonal recovery is uh, the first thing that's recommended to imp improve um, bone mineral density. Um, so basically we have to have a um, discussion about weight gain and nutrition in order for them to normalize their menses and therefore their bone mineral density. I touched on this a little bit. Um, so, you know, if the triad gets severe enough, it can start to affect your cardiovascular system. In other words, your heart. So estrogen is a very important hormone um, and it uh, stimulates uh, what's called nitric oxide, which promotes vascular smooth muscle dilation and is important for um, anti-atherosclerotic properties. Um, so it's really important for us to have that hormone. And when there is, um, lower or lack of the hormone, it can really affect your heart. Um, I sort of touched on this stuff already, so I won't belabor the point, but um, basically it comes down to what you're, what you're eating and how much energy you have um, after you're done exercising for all of these other um, things that take place in your body. So during your pre-participation exam or your sports physical, you might wonder why uh, we get so invasive with our questioning um, on section five of that exam. Um, but all of these questions here listed on the right side are some screening questions um, that are important for the female athlete triad. Physical examination for screening, um, as I mentioned, low BMI before, any recent weight loss, Low, low blood pressure upon standing. Uh, Lanugo is this excess hair kind of behind um, the neck or the ear. Um, hyperkeratinemia is an increased beta carotene levels with um, you know, increase in some of the foods that you eat. Now that's an extreme case there where you see the orange hand there. I can't say that I've ever seen that before, but <laughs> Julie might have. <laughs> um, other signs of eating disorders include parotid gland swelling, um, that sometimes can happen if there's a patient that's bulimic and inducing vomiting. Sometimes they can get some callus on their um, proximal interphalangeal joints, like right here from inducing vomiting. That's known as Russell's sign. So the treatment for female athlete triad is uh, pretty much, you know, it takes a team approach here um, to treat the triad depending on risk. Um, so you see here this um, chart for any inadvertent under eating. So the athlete's not really you know, just educated on proper nutrition. 
they just need some education. And I use Julie a lot for, for this type of thing. Um, she can see the athlete as an individual, determine what sports they play, what they need to eat. Um, so she really makes it individualized for the athlete specifically. Um, disordered eating, there needs to be a physician assessment and nutrition counseling. Um, again, on a, an intentional weight loss, nutrition education, clinical eating disorder um, should, you know, there really should be a mental health um, um, component added to that in terms of psychologist um, or psychiatrist. Um, so as I had mentioned before, the way to um, recover from the triad components, um, the very first thing is that you need to recover your energy status. That process takes days to weeks, depending on how compliant you are with um, your nutrition and weight gain. Lagging behind that is your menstrual status, um, which generally will take months to normalize after you've recovered your energy status. And the third thing to recover is actually, actually your bone mineral density, um, which can sometimes take years. And as I had suggested before, the most, you know, the most important time for um, bone development is during those teenage years. So we really need to be diligent about picking up um, these types of cases and paying attention to um, girls and their menstruation. Um, as I said, treatment focus, uh, reversal of recent weight loss, um, weight gain, um, you know, within the B normalize the BMI. Um, and then I'll let Julie talk a little bit more about uh, the nutrition side of that. So I have this little emoji face here because when you tell um, somebody who is self-conscious about their weight or is very conscious about what they put into their mouths, if you tell them that they have to eat more and they have to gain weight and they have to stop exercising, it doesn't go over well. So there's a, a way that you need to, um, you know, address this um, through your bedside manner and use different terminology and, you know, try to have empathy for the patient, set some, maybe some minor goals for the athlete um, in order for them to um, help themselves. Um, there is some hormone replacement therapy that has been out in the literature, including um, an estradiol transdermal patch, among a couple others. Um, and this should be considered um, in terms of treatment after six months of amenorrhea. I don't personally prescribe this. Um, that would be, you know, Dr. Helen Deitch, um, you know, scope of practice or a um, subspecialist within OBGYN that can monitor and adjust dosages and um, things like that. They can routinely see the patient. Um, there are some antidepressant medications that are particularly helpful for um, treatment of bulimia um, and depression. Oftentimes the two go hand in hand. Um, and then there's some also psychotropic medications that can be helpful for OCD um, and those types of diagnoses. Um, there is evidence lacking whether vitamin supplementation improves the bone mineral density, as I suggested before, but um, you should recommend that the optimal calcium intake between, should be between 1,200 and 1,500 for ages 11 to 24. And vitamin D really helps facilitate absorption of calcium. So um, the um, suggested dosage of vitamin D would be 400 to 800 international units daily. Both of these things can be found over the counter and the dosages should be listed. This is a cumulative risk assessment um, on, this is something that, that I would look at, look at as a physician. So I would put you know, everything into perspective here and determine what the athlete's risk is for the sport that they're participating in. So there's a scoring system here, and then there's a return to play, a suggested return to play. Um, so basically, you know, I have um, not cleared athletes to return to training until they've normalized um, some of these abnormalities because of the high risk of um, injury. This is all that goes into my return to play decision-making. Um, I won't go over all that with you. Um, I pretty much did here, but uh, you know, the sport is really important, the timing, uh, season, how competitive they are in sport, whether it be high school level, college level, D3 through D1. Um, you know, what their labs might look like, if there's any cardiac involvement, um, all things go into this uh, return to play decision making. So in summary, for my part, I think I'm on time, Julie. Um, 
the triad is three interrelated conditions, um, including disordered eating, amenorrhea, and osteoporosis, or any anywhere along that continuum that I showed to you at the beginning. Um, at risk would be women and girls participating in sports that emphasize, uh, emphasize leanness, but not always. Um, it can potentially be fatal in severe cases, as I touched on the cardiovascular involvement. Awareness and recognition is key to prevention and treatment. Um, Emphasis or pressure to achieve unrealistic body weight should be avoided by coaches, parents, administrators, and health professionals. Out of competition weigh-ins should be completely discouraged. Uh, athletes, athletic trainers, and coaches should all be encouraged to look for warning signs of eating disorders. And intervention requires a team approach to include physician, uh, dietitian, psychologist, supportive family, friends, teammates, and coaches. This is me. <laughs> Um, so this is what you can do um, to schedule an appointment. I, I work here in our York office at Powder Mill. Um, I do not currently go over to the West York office, but I am here at Powder Mill the majority of my time. I also go up to the Mechanicsburg office one to two days a week. Uh, you can find on our website under services, female athlete program, you can also schedule um, that way. My secretary's um, extension is there. Her name is Sean. You can schedule through her as well. And this is my email address and my cell phone number. These are my girls. Natalie's on the left, she is three. Evie is on the right, and she's two. <laughs> um, so, with that, I think before we take any questions, I'm going to turn it over to Julie. Julie, I've known for six years now. Yeah, I think. She, I think yeah. we officially met at the gym, right? Oh, that's right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> when we were weight, we were weightlifting. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, but Julie was at Wildspam when I was there for my fellowship training. So I've been working with her kind of on and off over the last several years. So I'm very fortunate to have her involved in this program. She's been a huge help. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Julie. Yeah, thank you. Um, I did respond to one question uh, we received. Um, and uh, like Dr. Kelly said, um, if you want to put any questions in the Q&A, uh, we'd be happy to answer them. Um, I, I, that was great information. You know, I think it's always something we need to think about when we look at um, look at this issue. Um, Dr. Kelly, you just have to stop sharing your screen and then I can share mine. Awesome. I think we're doing good with our technology, aren't we? All right, so I'm gonna be um, talking a little bit about, uh, let me see if I can get my uh, slides here pulled up. Okay, um, Abby, can you see, um, can you see my slides at the beginning of that? Looks good, no extra words on there or anything? Okay, awesome. Um, so, you know, one of the things when we think about nutrition, you know, there are so many different things we can think about when it comes to food. And we all have things we like, things we don't like. And so I'm gonna break it down tonight, just thinking a little bit about the foods that you do like really for physical activity and performance. And like Dr. Kelly had touched on, we all have a certain amount of food that we need, but you know, sometimes we just listen to mixed messages on that. Um, so uh, as um, Dr. Kelly mentioned, um, I'm Julie Stefanski. I am a registered dietitian. I'm a licensed uh, dietitian nutritionist for Pennsylvania. And I actually hold a certification as a sports dietitian. And I didn't know if you realized that today um, is National Nutrition Month. So it started for March. And the theme for National Nutrition Month uh, this year is personalize your plate. And that's one of the things I want you to keep in mind when you think about nutrition information. You know, we have so much misinformation that um, athletes are exposed to, especially on social media. And so when we see something, you know, just it's, it's a meme, it's, it's a little cartoon, it's information. You want to think about what is the source of this information? You know, is the person that you're getting this information qualified to share this information? You know, for me, I, I'm licensed. I have continuing education I follow. You know, I went to school six years and studied anatomy, physiology, food science. You know, we're really the only healthcare providers that study how food, um, you know, is made up and how food is prepared. So one of the things when you think about what a registered dietitian offers, you know, we're really not just giving a cookie cutter to everybody. 
we personalize that information. And so for you, being an athlete and looking at what you eat, you want to personalize what you eat. You don't want to just and said that. So how does these, this advice make you feel? You know, if somebody has told you that you should, you know, um, exercise without eating, how does that make you feel? Does it make you feel the best performance you could have? Does it make you feel guilty about certain foods? Are you really tired? And does it help or hurt your performance? Because when we think about different kinds of diets that people follow, if it's not really helping you perform the best, it might not be the best combination of food that you could have. And that's really one of the things that I, I like to talk about with the athletes I work with is really looking at personalizing your plate. So we're gonna you know, go into a little uh, uh, information that touches on some of the myths about nutrition. You know, if you've ever counted your calories, you've ever looked at how much energy your body burned, if we think about when does our body burn energy? If you think about that, you know, a lot of people say, well, when I'm running or when I'm exercising. And really the truth is, you know, our body burns energy during exercise, just casually sitting around. I'm burning some calories just here talking to you tonight during sleep. You know, we have energy being burned all the time. And so when we think about how much our body needs to, in order to fuel itself, we have this total amount of energy that we need on every single day, whether we exercise or not. So what's food called? I bet, you know, sometimes people wonder, you know, when we think about this word calories, we often hear that calories are a negative thing, you know, that they should be restricted or limited or monitored. And really calories are our energy that fuels our body for physical activity. So without enough calories, often people can really not perform as well as if they had fueled appropriately. And unfortunately, athletes sometimes only think about nutrition right before the big game, right? It's going to be really, it's the last game of the season. It's the championship. And so that's something that we want to practice fueling the same way as we're practicing anything, you know, for dancers practicing a new combination, food and food choices, beverages need to be practiced along with any type of exercise that we're doing. So when we look at the body and we think about where those calories are burned, think about if you had to skip fueling something in your body, is there something that you wouldn't want to fuel in your body? So if you think about an organ or a part of the body, when we look at where our body burns the most calories, I think most people would often say, oh, well, it's our legs or it's our arms, you know, if you're doing some kind of physical activity. But really all parts of our body burn calories in different ways. And so if we're restricting calories, like Dr. Kelly had touched on, not having enough energy for the body, out of the total energy that we need, let's say that a female, you know, a teenager might need 2000 calories. When we look at that number, that doesn't just go toward exercise, it goes towards all these other things. So out of the total energy we need, those calories your body needs, our brain burns around 20%. 19% of the calories goes to just brain function, thinking. 7% goes to our heart. The liver burns 27%. If you think about the, the body being detoxified and uh, having things eliminated from it, the liver and the kidneys really do that. So the kidneys burn around 10% of our calories and muscles are at 18%. So when we think about restricting calories and not getting enough, we're not just affecting our physical performance. We can be affecting our health too. And so only about 20% of the total calories that we need actually goes toward physical activity. That's not the bulk. Most of it goes toward metabolism and just energizing the body and keeping it alive. We, we do actually burn calories just from eating. So sometimes the more you eat, you know, you end up burning a little bit more because we do use 10% in digesting and metabolizing the food that we eat. So where does energy come from when we sleep? If you think about if you're somebody that you always get up in the morning and you exercise on an empty stomach, you know, a lot of times I'll ask people, you know, is that your norm? Does that work for you? 
when we see athletes get in trouble is really when they exercise longer and longer and they're not really used to it. So yes, some people can get up on an empty stomach and exercise, but the longer you go, let's think about if there was a soccer tournament and it's lasting all day, that catches up with people. And so when we look at trying to think about where we get fuel from, when we're sleeping, we use glycogen, which is stored fuel in our liver and our muscles. And when we're sleeping, you know, we use that to stay alive. So a lot of times if an athlete gets up in the morning or they're really restricted a long time, they're not going to have that stored fuel to pull out after about a half an hour to 90 minutes of exercising, we need to have replenishment in order to give fuel to the body. Because if you don't have any gas for your body to run, it's really going to um, not perform the best. So sleep is vitally important. You know, those of you that are teenagers or, you know, even some adults don't have the best sleep habits, right? We want to make sure that we're getting enough sleep because really in exercise, that's when we break down muscle. But during sleep, that's when it's recovered and rebuilt. So we want to really be making sure to get off the phone, get enough sleep, you know, trying to really have the body recover, you know, is an important part of health. So um, Dr. Kelly touched on this already a little bit. Um, when you think about the relative energy deficiency in sport or the female athlete triad, you know, quality in equals quality out. And if you don't have the good base of nutrition, a lot of different things can happen. So as I mentioned, not fueling adequately or not having the right combination of fuel can lead to inadequate glycogen or storage of energy you know, for your exercise. We can have decreased endurance, increased injury risk, because, you know, thinking about having a fall, having a fracture, you know, tearing a muscle, all of this must be replaced by nutrition and rebuilding the body. So sometimes there is a decreased training response and decreased muscle strength when poor nutrition, you know, is persistent. But also think about how you, how you feel when you're hungry. You know, we don't always have the best attitude. We don't have good judgment. So not having enough fuel, you know, during any type of physical activity can actually lead to impaired judgment, decreased coordination, which can increase your risk of injury, uh, decreased concentration, irritability, um, depression. It's something that, you know, we need to have that good fuel coming in to just feel our best, perform our best. And if you don't feel your best, you know, something, the combination of what you're choosing, um, you know, whether it's sleep or nutrition or over-exercising, you know, can definitely catch up with you. So as a registered dietitian, one of the things that I'm trained in is really looking at, you know, how to calculate somebody's food uh, portion amounts, amount of food that they need and their energy needs. So I look at how much exercise someone is doing, um, their body shape, how their weight has changed over a period of time, their age, their gender. I look at a lot of different things to determine this. And we talk about whether somebody, you know, is, is at the appropriate amount or they're not. Um, and like Dr. Kelly had mentioned, I don't specialize in disordered eating. So when someone does have a true eating disorder, we would usually work with a team of specialists to make sure that the right messaging is coming across because there are certain behaviors we don't want to be doing with somebody who has the tendency to have um, an eating disorder. So it's really important to identify this and then use the right strategies, you know, in working with a team of healthcare providers to deal with that. Um, but, you know, if you think about just energy needs, you know, the average athlete might have energy needs in between 2000 and 6000 calories really depends on intensity, size of the body. And that's something we want to individualize. So just because an app, you know, I see this, I call this the app gap, you know, sometimes an app might target someone's calorie needs and it, it's, it's totally totally off of what somebody needs. Um, one of the apps that sometimes my clients use, I've had it give adult women, women 1000 calories to eat. And you know, a, a one year old infant needs 1000 calories to survive. So an adult woman has much higher calorie needs than 1000 calories. So when you think about that, you don't want to go by an arbitrary number that an app has decided on. You want to go by how your body feels and make sure that you're not underestimating or overestimating what your body needs. So you want to listen to your body, 
You want to eat if you're hungry and try to refuel because your body's not going to steer you wrong. And you want to really be in touch with that. So definitely don't get stuck in the app gap and just go by what some arbitrary app has recommended. Um, so one of the things in thinking about just timing of your energy intake, this is something that's really different for everybody and really based on how food is metabolized, but also then how your stomach responds to having food in it. Sometimes people have to really eat much you know, far in advance of when they're exercising and other people can eat right up to the time that they're gonna exercise and they don't have those kinds of stomach issues. So when you think about just learning, you know, to train your stomach to expect food, you wanna really start with something that's really easy to digest if this is not a habit for you. The easiest foods we have to digest really would be liquids, moving into something that's an easy to digest carbohydrate and then a mixed meal. So the first place is really to think about, you know, how far in advance are you eating before you're exercising and how, how good is your energy when you get done? You know, that's how you really judge. Can you really push through to the end or are you really running out of fuel, running out of energy? And so, it, you know, it's different for everybody, but it's really enough that we keep our blood sugar in a good range to fuel our body and to stay hydrated so that we're really performing at the best that we can. So, you know, when you think about, let's say that there is practice right after school, you know, or you have a game. Typically, most people, if you're going to have a full meal, it should be eaten, eaten about one to two hours before um, the exercise because the body needs to digest it in the stomach. It travels through the intestine and then you would take those components up into your blood to be used as fuel. And so typically carbohydrates or what gives us the maximum amount of energy while we're performing. It doesn't necessarily have to be something high in sugar, but typically a mixed meal, when they look at the athlete's plate, we usually want to have, you know, um, a part of it being something that is from the grain group or a starchy vegetable so that it can provide that fuel. Um, really meals before we exercise shouldn't be really high in fiber. I always remember talking to uh, one of the high school volleyball teams and they were just laughing their head off about somebody that eat in a really high fiber bar before, you know, one of their matches and what happened to her, you know, and it, it's really something that we don't want to have fiber right before we have any kind of, you know, athletic event that doesn't benefit us at that time of the day. Um, but meals should often be high in fluid, moderate in protein. And if you're somebody that's a salty sweater, um, that you see salt on your face or salt on your skin or you sweat a lot, then we look at that amount of sodium that might be in your meals that you're needed to prevent cramping or, you know, to make sure that you are retaining the fluid that you're taking in. As you get closer to a game or practice, you know, we really have to choose things that are best. So if we think about the difference between a pack of raisins very easily digested in a nut bar, you know, having some type of nut bar, you know, 10 minutes before you exercise really is not going to be digested until well after the event is over. So it's something that you want to make sure that your pre-workout options really are digested and that they're metabolized and you're using them at the time that you're exercising rather than it being, you know, ready for to fuel you, you know, an hour after you are done, you know. So many times, and not necessarily breakfast, you know, but in thinking about something that, you know, whatever that first meal of the day is, or that, that meal that's two hours before you're exercising, typically something that contains carbohydrate, a grain, um, you know, in thinking about like a breakfast burrito with your protein in the eggs, a vegetable, you know, having that tortilla, you know, sometimes people need much larger amounts of carbohydrate have liquids contain carbohydrate just to get enough, you know, if it's a really large uh, person that's really doing a lot of activity. So just a couple ideas, you know, you can see that there's kind of a theme there that we have a little bit of carb, a little bit of protein, and a little bit of fat, you know, just to, you know, get that in there. But if we think about something like, you know, just having an avocado before you exercise, you know, avocados are super healthy, but they're primarily a fat it's not gonna really be digested and available for fuel until well after it's been eaten and digested. So that's why carbohydrates are typically prioritized because that's gonna be your fastest fuel 
for the exercise. As it gets closer to the time that you are going to be exercising, you know, let's say that maybe, you know, it's lunchtime and you skip lunch. And I say boo, because, you know, we shouldn't be doing that. We have to fuel ahead of time. But let's say that you needed something really fast. It needs to be available, you know, in the next couple minutes. That's where, you know, you have to plan ahead, you know, make sure you get that fuel in there so that it's metabolized well in advance. And you want something really easy to digest. Maybe it's a couple of crackers, it's graham crackers, it's some dry cereal, um, you know, an applesauce pouch, you know, like those little ones that you can put in a backpack, you know, something that really is digested quickly because otherwise it's, it's probably set, not really be available to fuel your muscles, you know, when it's needed. This is where sometimes sports drinks or chews or uh, gummies come in because they, they need to be digested quickly. You know, not obviously the, the best quality nutrition, but you know, when you're looking at something that needs to be metabolized quickly, you know, that is something that's been well researched to show that it helps performance in athletes. Uh, this is actually a picture of what they consider the athlete's plate. And if you can see there, you know, it's something when we think about having that meal afterwards or the meal two hours before, Right after practice to really refuel muscles, it's recommended to have a snack right away, you know, within the first hour, and then within an hour to an hour and a half to really have that balanced meal. So a balanced meal will be something that contains a whole grain, you know, it could be a sweet potato, it could be, you know, a, a potato. It doesn't have to necessarily be a grain, but we want to have something that is a carbohydrate. Half of the plate should be our fruits and vegetables, you know, our starchy vegetables like potatoes, you know, those are very high in potassium. And so there's different recipes you can do to have a baked potato with some broccoli and a little bit of cheese on it, you know, some different things that would refuel the muscles. And then we want to have that, you know, quarter plate of the protein to really rebuild muscle uh, damage that's taken place during exercise. Want to definitely have those beverages to rehydrate. And then in thinking about, you know, our flavors, we all have our favorites, you know, and we all do, you know, we don't have to be perfect with our nutrition to really fuel, fuel our body well, but we want to try to keep in mind balance and really taking time, you know, to enjoy our food because we have taste buds for a reason, you know, it's okay to enjoy um, foods that are fun and flavorful. Um, so just a couple power recovery foods, you know, and thinking about things that you can take along to a game or, um, you know, take um, on the bus, you know, if there's going to be several games and you're traveling, a lot of people like to do a small bag of pretzels with some peanut butter, you have that carbohydrate and protein and fat there, peanut butter and jelly sandwich, chocolate milk and a banana, a fruit smoothie, Greek yogurt. Uh, trail mix, you know, very easy and things that don't necessarily need to be uh, refrigerated. And so um, hopefully they give you a couple ideas, you know, to get that energy uh, intake up, you know, and make sure that you really are fueling at the right time and picking the right combination. Um, as I said, I'm Julie Stefanski. Um, I do have a website, it's stefanskynutrition.com and my email is right there. Um, I'm on Instagram at foodhelp123. So you're welcome to, um, you know, DM me if you have any questions. And um, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my uh, screen here in a second. And then uh, Dr. Kelly and I will uh, take any questions you have for the uh, last couple minutes of the webinar. Thanks, Julie. Uh, before we start answering some questions, I just want to um, mention before some people start signing off here that um, we do have a scheduled symposium for the uh, female athlete program scheduled for um, July 31st. Uh, that's something that we've been trying to do here over the last year, but we keep having to reschedule it because of COVID uh, with the um, restrictions and how many people can be together. So um, during that symposium, Dr. Jared Spencer, the sports psychologist, will be there. Um, and he's going to lecture a little bit on um, a topic uh, um, in terms of sports psychology. So just keep that in mind. There's more information to come about that. So Great. we'll take any questions now. Yeah. Um, off to you that we received earlier. Um, it said, how often, if ever, do you see athletes who struggle with substance abuse or abuse as a result of pressure to perform in school and on the field? Mm-hmm. So I would say that um, how often have I personally seen it? Um, I'd say a handful of times since I've been in practice. Um, 
you know, whether it be a performance enhancing um, drug, you know, supplement or uh, a weight loss uh, way, you know, ways to lose weight, uh, such as like laxative use. Um, I've probably seen it more often at the college level. Um, but, you know, so far in practice, I've been here five years, probably a handful of times. So that's something that I, I definitely screen for. I have a, um, I have sort of a little questionnaire that I have my female athletes uh, fill out when they come in. And that's um, part of the questionnaire is what if any medications or supplements are you currently taking? Um, and are you currently using um, drug, alcohol or tobacco products? Okay, um, so we have another question. It looks like it's a nutrition question. Um, it says, what is the best way to tell if you need to eat because you're actually hungry versus bored or emotional eating? I've heard you can often be dehydrated rather than hungry and should drink water, wait five minutes and you're still hungry, then eat something. Is that a good guideline? I definitely say yes for that. You know, it's just an experimental uh, try. You know, I'm somebody that doesn't always hydrate myself the best. And so I often find I have a headache or I'm tired and I thought, oh, I haven't even had any water for a little bit. So that's um, to do that. Um, one of the things that sometimes uh, there's a dietitian named Jessica Setnick and she's an eating disorder specialist. And she actually recommends something that's called the apple test. When you think about whether you're having emotional eating or not. And the apple test means, you know, if you are physically hungry, you could eat an apple and it would take care of that. Yeah. So he says, when you have physical hunger, you know, that's something that, you know, you could do the apple test. If you are actually craving chips or chocolate or some other thing, it's, it could be emotional eating. And so when you think about, is it hunger or is it not, you know, it's good to sometimes start off with something that, you know, um, you know, just to kind of judge when did I last eat and then try that. So that's one of the things that I think is a good idea. It's like, are you craving something that's more emotional or are you craving something for physical hunger? So you can definitely try something that's not your favorite. See if you're still craving and it might be an emotional hunger, you know, versus physical. Um, so uh, we'll take a couple more questions. Uh, the next one is for Dr. Kelly. Um, have you seen higher incidence in ACL tear in females during their period? And are... Yeah, so, you know, typically if, since I'm not a surgeon, when I'm diagnosing the ACL rupture, I oftentimes will then, you know, get the confirmatory MRI and bump it to the orthopedic surgeon. It's not generally a question that I, that I ask uh, the athlete, you know, whether or not they had their, you know, period when uh, they ruptured their ACL, but um, you know, most, mostly females are at increased risk of ACL ruptures because of their um, biomechanics. So their weak core, um, you know, small gluteal hip strength, uh, and the way that translates down to the knee when they jump and they land. So that type of thing, um, you know, is what's probably the more, more common um, reason why AC, ACL tears are at increased risk um, for females. But that's a good question. I'd have to research that, see if there's any literature out there on that. And I'm, Julie, I can see the questions now. Um, hopefully I answer that question appropriately. How much do you work with adult women, including perimenopausal women trying to maintain performance? So often there is really no age cutoff um, in terms of who I see here in the office. Um, and so I'm happy to see um, any woman of any age that is just trying to um, stay in shape and be healthy. And I'm happy to facilitate their care. And I guess we'll take, we have one more question. Do you want to just do that one last? I, I can do that one. I see um, it's from Coach Enders, right? <laughs> so okay. the question is how much, how much water to drink throughout the day for runners training in the summer? So, you know, um, for any athlete, you know, it's just important to try to make sure that they are drinking regularly during practice. I see way too many coaches not encouraging water or making time for it, but really people should drink until their urine, you know, is a, a light yellow or clear. 
versus something that's really uh, dark. So if someone's not peeing at all, or they're peeing and it's really a dark color, they're not drinking enough. And so there are ways that you can measure that. You can have athletes weigh themselves before and after practice and see how much weight they lost because really you calculate that based on, you know, what their weight change is. So definitely, I think starting with some, you know, is a good place to start. Um, but then typically they recommend, you know, really for runners or for athletes, the recommendation is really at least four ounces every like 15 minutes to every half an hour to replace what's lost. And so, you know, you know, if you think about an ounce being a gulp of water, you know, we have people, you know, exercising for a long time without any. So really getting up to that goal of what is recommended for sports performance, most people are really well below that. So hopefully that answers the question. Well, we can take a few more if anybody else has any other questions. I think that was the last one. Yeah, we'll just, um, we'll give it a couple minutes if anyone's typing out a question. Otherwise, um, we'll kind of conclude the presentation. Julie, I'll defer to you for that one. The question is, I was always taught to drink Gatorade. If you did high intensity workouts for one hour, water, water otherwise, is that correct? And I would say yes. You know, when you think about whether you need carbohydrate, water is good for the first 60 to 90 minutes, but then that's where carbohydrate usually has to come in. But, you know, if it's really, really hot, that's all thrown out the window because we really need to have that sodium and the carbohydrate coming in to force the fluid into the cells. So in the heat, you know, it's really recommended that we have a sports drink for athletes that are really sweating heavily so that they get the maximum hydration in. But yeah, that's a really good, usually an hour, you know, if kids are just going outside and they're playing soccer for half an hour, they do absolutely not need a sports drink whatsoever. So I think that is a definitely a good cutoff there. Good, and thanks for your comment there. We like to talk and share, right, Abby? Yes, we do. <laughs> yes, of course. Thank you all for joining. So feel free to reach out, you know, if you have any questions. Okay, I think that wraps it up. Right. Thank you, Julie. Yeah, thanks a lot. Nice getting Great. to see you. Have a nice night, everybody. All right, see ya.